Anakin Skywalker. Meet Obi Wan Kenobi. Hi. You're a Jedi too. Pleased to meet you. Welcome back to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. Obi-Wan Kenobi showed us an epic lightsaber duel between the former master and his apprentice. But what's even more compelling about this show is the secret journey that Obi-Wan and Vader go through during the season. I think that they have the most pivotal relationship in Star Wars. And this season wasn't really about Leia or the spark that lights the fire, none of that. This season, the entire time, has been about Obi-Wan and Anakin getting closure. Well, that's not a secret. All right, fine. But it is an underlying meaning buried within the plot that shapes and molds these two into the characters that we see in A New Hope. So get ready for some couch therapy because we're going to dive deep into why this season was all about the stages of grief. A long time ago in a desert planet far, far away where everything significant seems to happen, we find Obi-Wan. My name is Ben. I'm sorry, Ben Kenobi on the very planet that Anakin and his kin are from, Tatooine. Not a great plan. He's dealing with his grief with extreme denial, which is the first stage of the grieving process. Ben has taken every part of himself and buried it metaphorically by living in an enclosed cavern and physically by burying his lightsaber in the middle of nowhere. The fight is done. We lost. That seems like he's accepted his reality. Well, that is not what he's in denial about. Obi-Wan accepted back in episode three that the fight was over and he had lost his Padawan. Now, when we find him here in episode one of the series, he's in denial that he can still make a difference, that he can change or alter any outcome. He no longer thinks himself capable of being of use. Neither does Owen, apparently. When the time comes, he must be trained. Like you trained his father? Not even Owen, very good. After the initial shock of his Padawan turning to the dark side, there is very little left of this formerly dashing Clone Wars general. He was once charismatic, confident, and one with the Force, and the Force was with him. But now this Ben Kenobi is weak and is easily pushed over by the farmer now raising Anakin's son. Even when Bail Organa pleads for help once over a communicator and once in person, he doubts that he can do it. Obi-Wan pins it on someone else. We your guard then. Or a bounty hunter. My heart breaks for old Ben in this scene. You can see the fear of failure creep up into his face and the trauma of his past oversights. The responsibility is overwhelming for him. I'm not who I used to be. Find someone else. But Bail Organa prevails in insisting that Obi-Wan battle his demons and risk it for Leia. Not a boy, Bail. Meanwhile, on the planet Mustafar, we come upon Castel de Vader. Look upon it in awe. Ah. We get a glimpse of how Anakin is dealing with his baggage, a la the back to tank. Now, I love this shot on how he has to be assembled every day, seven days of space week. This is how Anakin's last encounter with Obi-Wan has left him. The man can literally not breathe, walk, or talk without this suit. Must be a really lonely existence for him being a slave to machinery. He can't live a normal life any longer. Plus, the one he used to call master, brother, and friend is the one who put him inside this death suit. Be kind of hard to take your mind off of that. When Vader discovers Obi-Wan may have been found, none of the Emperor orders or missions matter anymore. Kenobi is all that matters now. Is that understood? Well, that's just laser-focused anger, which is the second stage of grief. Hollywood loves a good anger phase when dealing with the character's grief. It's usually the catalyst for the beginning of a brutal undertaking, from Kill Bill to John Wick to... I don't feel anything emotionally except for rage. 24-7, 365 at a million percent. All right, well, maybe not that. Sith Lords thrive on this stage and just never leave it. Let the heat flow through you. One of the most talked about scenes from the series is when Vader hunts his prey and savors each and every second of it. He draws Kenobi out by killing innocent bystanders, which is just terrifying. He slowly stalks him like Jason. And when he's done playing with his food, Vader ignites a fire and drags Kenobi through it. Now you will suffer, Obi-Wan. However, my dig at Kenobi came right before when Kenobi asks, What have you become? I am what you made me. Er, burn. No joke. Physically and mentally, Vader came to play ball. There is clear baggage and the years have made this rage fester. It's challenging to move past something if you're holding onto a grudge and you're wrapped up with guilt, which leads to suffering. Luckily for Kenobi, he's saved by Tala. Then they both get submerged in a back to tank, and there is time to have a break and meditate. Shadows of their past swarm them. The fallout of their last battle is strong with them, and neither of them can let it go. This is when I believe that Kenobi enters the bargaining stage. Leia is kidnapped. Again? Yes, I know, again, and at the expense of Tala rescuing Obi-Wan instead. So now Ben copes with his depression over Anakin by focusing on Leia. You could argue a little bit of bargaining crept into Ben since Bail Organa asked, 
Help me, Obi Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. Wait. You couldn't save Anakin. But you can save her. That's what I meant to use. However, Ben doesn't really begin bargaining until his first encounter with Vader. Rescuing Leia in general is a nice esteem boost for Kenobi. She is a catalyst to reuniting him with the Force, making him feel useful. She gives him purpose. She gives him hope. This was a necessary plot point to the series. Leia's multiple rescues were necessary plot points to the series. We get to see Ben get his Obi-Wan back before he can face his larger demon, Vader. Kenobi falls heavily into this bargaining phase in the second half of the season. Vader wants me. If you he expects me to surrender. He knows I'll do everything I can to protect these people. Yeah. I'm the one that Vader wants. Promise me that you get her home, Haja. Yes, I do believe Obi-Wan feels like he's being helpful, but up to a point. I find the bargaining phase to be the most seductive phase besides anger. It has the illusion of making progress. It's the action phase. What can I do to work past my pain? How can I atone for my mistakes? Do I need to sacrifice something? Overcompensate in some areas so I feel better? Tala and Ben have a great scene about how both of them use their grief and about how both are still plagued by their past sins. But Ben slips a little too far down the path of martyrdom. Then it's just about Obi-Wan making himself feel better over the safety of others. You're hunting him. Let me help you. And I love that the writers have Roken call him out on this. You can't just throw that away. It won't make a difference. They want all of us. And later he does it again when Kenobi suggests taking a single pod for himself to derail Vader to another planet so the rebel ship can flee. It's not about us, is it? You want to do it. Yes, he does. Obi-Wan knows that it will make himself feel better if he faces Vader again, and the opportunity is right there. He has to take it. This is where the coping mechanism of the bargaining phase begins to fail. It's not about helping anymore. It's about self-serving. Would the ship have escaped had Obi-Wan not been so keen on a rematch? I mean, that's up for debate. Regardless, this behavior further solidifies that his grief is front and center around a budding rebellion. So I want to point out that even though they say that depression is stage four in the grieving process, it's been with Kenobi this entire time. Ben's depression is so strong that it's linked to his ability to tap into the Force and communicate with Qui-Gon. Master Qui-Gon. Master. In the beginning, he's buried his former self out in the desert. He calls out to Qui-Gon and receives emptiness. He works, eats, looks after Luke, and has nightmares. He has a heavily worn energy and he's always tired. When it comes to the Force, boy, is that a struggle. Ben trembles when he holds a lightsaber for the first time. It looks like he's straining every bone in his body to catch Leia, and then it gets wiped clean in his first confrontation with Vader. I don't think Obi-Wan fully lets go of this depression stage until Vader has him pinned under rubble in Episode 5. With all the weight on his shoulders and the voices of his past echoing his failures and disappointments, he makes the choice to let go of what can't be changed and move into what is significant and matters right now. And it's awesome. Side note, anyone else think Ben was channeling Ong when he was facing the Fire Lord Ozai? Nope. All right, then just me. With some clever girl thinking, Obi-Wan schools Vader once more with tactical strikes, pinpointing elements of his armor that make it function, making him incapable of battle. And part of his helmet comes clean off. Oh, it's such a good scene. Maybe my favorite. It's the first time Obi-Wan looks into the eye of Anakin. Here comes the stage of acceptance. I'm sorry, Anakin. For all of it. Now, in that moment of weakness, we see Anakin show a little bit of mercy for his former master by releasing him from the guilt. You didn't kill Anakin Skywalker. I did. Then my friend is truly dead. Here you can see the love these two shared for one another and the realization that nothing will ever be the same. It's heartbreaking. And I love that they gave Anakin this moment as well. The anger is still there and it's strong, but there's evidence that there is still good in him somewhere. With the final death, Kenobi yet again walks away, but this time from a Sith Lord and not away from a friend. Acceptance has now been entered. Kenobi is able to no longer bear the weight of what happened and he begins to look forward to the future. Vader's acceptance, however, does not come until his last scene with the Emperor. If your past cannot be overcome. Basically, Palpatine is challenging Vader's competency in being able to carry on his duties. Anakin cannot keep his station if the Emperor thinks he's incapable. The Inquisitors are something that Vader worries that the Emperor will use against him should he fail. Kenobi is a distraction from the bigger picture. Kenobi is insignificant. If he wants to keep his fortress, his rank, his life, his relationship with Kenobi must be closed. So Vader accepts this reality, for now. And at last, we've come to the end of the road. Kenobi travels to say goodbye properly to Leia and honor the memory of her parents. You are wise discerning, kind-hearted. These are qualities that came from your mother, but you're also passionate, 
and fearless, forthright, and these are gifts from your father. He's not the Jedi that he once was, but he is a Jedi once again, ever so much closer to the wise and masterful Allegenis. Then he returns to that wonderful, desolate planet that everything seems to happen on. I mean, there's still Luke to look after, right? Well, it turns out the Lars clan's pretty capable of watching over Luke themselves, but Obi-Wan's just fine with that. And once he lets go of the need to watch Luke, he gets to meet him. You see what happens when you work past your demons? You get to say your catchphrase. Hello there. You get a new wardrobe, but you still have to live out in the middle of nowhere. I'm sorry, Ben. Get thee to the mountains, canyons. Go bring some bantha milk to the sand people. Well, look, at least he won't be alone, because now that Obi-Wan has fully let go of his grief, he gets a present. Qui-Gon. You just were not ready to see. That line right there, you weren't ready to see. That is why this entire series hasn't been about politics, war, kids with droids, and space wizards. All right, well, they're all in there too. It's been about closure. Kenobi couldn't go from the Jedi in episode three to the Jedi in episode four without some serious self-reflection and therapy. And now that he sees, new doors can be opened. Both Vader and Obi-Wan have new missions, new realities, and are one with the Force, and the Force is with them. I'm one with the Force, the Force is with me. I'll be at different ends of the Force, but still, with the Force, nonetheless. But that's just me rambling on. What do you think? Do you agree that Obi-Wan season one was all about closure the entire time? Did you find the stages of grief in the show or did we get it all wrong? Whatever your comments are, let me know down in the comments below or you can at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, be sure to subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.